Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Hello. <laughs> this is Karen Hutton. That's me. We are live today uh, in my studio. And uh, it's a big mess, so I have a backdrop up. And so while I'm waiting for everybody to come on in here, I'll tell you that today we're going to, uh, I'm going to answer some questions. I've got a bunch of questions that came in this week about shooting, about photographing horses, about photographing, period. Oh, I also meant to get, I meant to grab my, um, my camera and I forgot. So if that comes up and you actually want to see, uh, the camera that I use to photograph horses with, um, I'll grab it. But, uh, mostly I think we can talk about it. So I see a few familiar names. Hello, everyone. I usually try not to, to uh, say people's names because sometimes people want to be anonymous and lurk. And you can do that even though I can see your name. I, it's okay if you lurk. I lurk. I'm a lurker. So welcome, welcome. As you, as you come in and producer Steph is in the house. Producer Steph is in the house. Uh, <laughs> hi, Steph. <laughs> okay, I'll use your name because... You already gave me permission. So, hey, while everybody's coming in, um, throw out your location. Where are you hailing from today? I love this part. I love seeing where everybody's from. Sometimes you're shy and you don't want to put it in there, but I know we have Costa Rica in the house. I know that. <laughs> and um, so I'm just going to, you know, chat here for a few minutes while I wait for everybody to get in here. Chicago. We got Chicago in the house and Costa Rica, where I'm going to visit one of these days when we can do things like that again, safely, uh, knowing we can still get home again. <laughs> oh, that's a whole other topic. Anyway, um, so lovely to see everyone coming in here. I have my uh, questions. What I... For those of you who are just coming in today, I'm going to answer questions. I've had some come in this week about photographing horses specifically. The reason being I've been talking a lot about horses is that I'm running a charity event right now for this wonderful organization right right near me um, called the Wild Horse Connection, who does an incredible job not just saving not just saving the horses and like save the horses, but working really with the community. Um, and the horses, because our community where I live and the wild horses, they overlap. And so there's a little bit of friction in that area. So to mitigate that and to work with both sides of the equation, the Wild Horse Connection works with the uh, Nevada uh, Department of Agriculture, law enforcement, legal and everything to, you know, make it work smoothly for both species, human and horses. And they do a masterful job. It's very unusual. It's not, you know, it's not the norm. So I really wanted to support them as in the way that I can, which is through my art. So, um, Steph, do you mind putting, maybe, I don't know if I can, maybe you can do it and pin it, um, where to go to see the charity event. I forgot to s copy that link. I forgot a few things this morning, mostly because does anybody else spend half their time looking for their earbuds or their phone or where did they put that thing they need right now, like 30 seconds ago? Because that's me. And that was me this morning. <laughs> I couldn't find my earbuds. Thanks, Steph. I appreciate that. Um, Hey, Bruce Garber, I'm going to call, I don't normally name names, but you know, some of you that I know that don't mind that I say your name, I'm going to say, hey, lovely to see you. Um, yeah, so I think I'm going to get going. Where else is everybody from? I know we've got East Coast US. I know we've got South America. I know oftentimes we have Dubai and Scotland and other places, which is always great fun. So I think today... Um, yeah, so, so the Wild Horse Connection and the charity event is why I've been talking horses so much. Plus, I've just been, I don't know, I've never really shared that much of my past before in social media. So I've been using Throwback Thursdays to talk a little bit about where I hail from and my crazy, crazy background of as an actor, as a horse trainer, as a voiceover artist, as a, uh, you know, a dancer, 
figure, did I say figure skating? I mean, it's crazy. So I've been posting, you know, throwback Thursday pictures and I've been doing a lot with the horses because I rode horses and trained for, uh, and trained horses and taught riding for 45 years. And it's, you know, it's just so much a part of my life. Thank you, Steph. So she just pinned, let's see, do I need to pin that? I am going to pin that comment. Um, <clears throat> Steph just put the link where you can see the charity event uh, in the in the comments. It's pinned now to the top. So this today, talking about photographing horses, and, the, and it was funny because I got a bunch of questions this week about that. And... Um, and that charity event is where you can go and check it out and learn more. And I'll be posting more info there because uh, I'll be doing some lives. Uh, well, hopefully lives if we have enough reception, but at least videos from on location next week, I believe. And so um, there's just a lot to learn. And this is a very, very unique organization. And I've been really wanting to get behind someone doing really good work in the world right now. And they're right here doing it. So it's super inspiring. And, um, and I hope you'll check it out. I hope you'll donate. You donate to win even as low as $10. Those of you who are just, you know, wanting to pick my brain, which I notice <laughs> a lot of people do, there's a, there's a level you can enter to win an hour long zoom call with me and ask me anything about photography, about horses, about <laughs> whatever. And, uh, yeah, so that's there. You can win, you know, different size prints, but all of the money, um, you know, the expenses to run this and to fulfill it are very, very minimal. So once those expenses are paid for, all the money beyond that goes straight to Wild Horse Connection and I'm taking care of that. So I make sure that happens. So I hope, so you can also find a link. Yes, thank you. You can also find a link on, um, in my bio because I have a nice little link tree there. All right. Without further ado, much ado, let's get into some questions. So um, I have a very specific, I have a couple specific questions, but let me get kind of the general ones out of the way and I'm gonna do it this way. Um, I'm gonna do it by showing pictures because some of the questions have to do with, um, you know, settings, cameras, lenses, etc., cetera, and, and in, Putting this together, I had some observations that I thought were kind of funny um, about me, about the way I do things. So first of all, anytime I answer these questions, understand this is not a blanket like, this is how it's done in photography. This is how I do it. And, you know, it's a starting point for many of you. And you can play with these, uh, these ideas and figure out what works for you. Because a lot of the stuff I'm talking about is, you know, shooting any kind of uh, subject, really, um, animals, your pets, um, even people, although I'm not a portrait photographer. I don't, I don't photograph people as a rule, except for, you know, on occasion, because I tend to be more of a landscape travel type photographer. And now, well, I've always been a horse photographer all my life. So, okay. I wrote this down because I want to pull it together. So when you're photographing horses, you got a few things uh, to think about. And that has to do with movement, the horse moving, what you want to have in focus, what the story is you're telling, um, how much light you have, you know, that's going to all affect your setting. So I think what I'll do is um, change the angle here. Will it flip for me? Thank you. And by the way, I've had some audio problems with lives in recent lives, um, but I've done something different this time, which I hope mitigates it. So if we have any audio problems, I hope you'll uh, pipe up and, and <clears throat> excuse me, tell me as I choke on my own saliva, which is really too much information, but we're friends. So I thought you should know. All right. So here's a really basic um, horse image, right? So one of the babies out in the field and what I like to do now, what a lot of horse photographers do, there's a trend for replace, you know, background replacement and you make some, um, groovy thing happen in the background. I do that sometimes, but I don't do it as a rule. So what I try to do, you know, it's hard because you're, you're dealing with, an, you know, animals that are moving and they're out in the wild and, you know, it's, it's a little bit like a crapshoot sometimes, 
but to, there's just a few things to know. One is, you know, people do background replacements because they have crappy backgrounds and they want to make it more dramatic. Well, this was a good background, so I don't feel like I need to replace it. It's just a really basic photograph of a little baby. And I, I do try to, like our light for shooting the horses, I hate saying shooting the horses, photographing the horses, um, is better in the afternoon, the late afternoon. For me, is a better quality of light for the horses in this area, in Nevada. Um, so I, I tend to go out in the afternoon. So this is late afternoon light. And what I do is I focus right here on the little eyeball. And I'm not going to zoom it in because in order to show this to you really well, it's going to it kind of does this endless zoom in, which is annoying. And I can't just do it a certain amount. Unless you really need to see it, then I'll switch apps and do it right. But anyway, this is how I like to show them. So I will, in a shot like this, I want the rest of the body to sort of melt, begin to melt. I don't know if you can see my, I'm going to move it slowly, my pointer. I want it to melt and I want the background to blur. The only way to really get the background to blur, there's two ways. One, you need some distance between your subject and the background. The other is to use a low, uh, I'm going to say f-stop even though it's your aperture setting. Here's why. This is one of my observations. When I photograph, personally, it's a very instinctive sort of process. I've photographed a long time, so I don't think in terms of my aperture setting and, you know, my... I mean, I do think ISO, but I don't think of the words is my point. So when I say f-stop, I'm going to say f-stop, so uh, rather than like aperture and um, shutter speed and stuff, unless I'm making a particular point. It's not because I'm ignorant. It's just because that's the way my my instinctive brain works um, because it sees in pictures. It doesn't think in words. Now, I don't know if yours does that. I'm just mentioning it because some people feel um, a lot of beginner f photographers, they get a little, you know, f um, messed up in the head because they can't remember all the terminology. And I'm just saying, I don't think aperture. I think f-stop. So there you go. I'm going to show you the settings on this one. I actually pull this over here. <clears throat> and I'm going to zoom this in. If you can see that, I don't know. Is that even in focus? I can't tell. So, whoa, sorry. A little tripod. It's a very expensive $17 tripod that I have here. So don't bug me. All right. So what we have here is I usually aim my standard like over the, you know, with the wild horses. Now, I, I photographed horses my whole life, but, you know, back in manual days, it was a little bit different than it is in digital. So there was a long period of time that I did not photograph horses, and then now I'm doing wild horses. And part of the question I've had, and you should have anytime you, you sort of start a different genre or begin to head a new direction is what, story do you want to tell? What is, what's going to be your mark? What's going to be your, you know, fingerprint, thumbprint, it, you know, personal print on the work that you do? So you learn some basic good techniques and then you decide where you're going to take it. So that has been kind of my last couple of years in doing this was, you know, taking good photos, you know, they're solid. Um, but what's my stamp, so to speak? So this is kind of a solid photo and I usually start with uh, f5.6. Now I photograph with a, I'm a Fujifilm girl, I'm actually a professional Fujifilm X photographer. When I go out to photograph horses I use the 100 to 400 lens and an X-T3. So X-T3 is an APS-C sensor, and so you pretty much, to figure out your settings, you multiply it times 1.5 for the full frame equivalent. I know those of you that aren't photographers, <laughs> that's a bunch of jibber-jabber, so ignore me. But you photographers, that's important because these settings that we talk about are largely dependent on the gear that you use and the effect you're going for. So I want, with the X-T3, at, with the APS, uh, APS-C sensor, um, I want, I use F uh, 5.6, so 1.5 times that is, what is that, F11 in full frame? And that usually for me gets 
enough in focus. I'm going to go back to the image and show you what I mean. And then I aim for to be able to shoot with a shutter speed of, of a, around a thousand. Now you see in this case, it's, it's 800th of a second. So I try to aim for a thousandth of a second, but my subject was also still. So that was an okay thing and it was all in focus and that was groovy. I used an ISO of 500 and that allowed those settings. In a darker situation, I have to raise the ISO. And yes, you get more green. That's part of the question I'm going to talk about here after we go over these basics. Um, but F uh, 5.6 is like my standard. I'm going to go to photograph wild horses. F 5.6. I make exceptions depending on what I'm after. And I'll show you about that, those in a minute. And then these are the, the rest of the settings that you would be worried about. Let's look at another one. Oh, and where do I focus? I do I use, um, I usually use, well, depends. Depends on how close I am. For this, I don't remember right offhand if I used, um, you know, my not spot focus, but the one above it. Hold on, I'm going to grab my camera. Um, every manufacturer uses a little different terminology. So I'm going to be speaking in Fujifilm. Um, Canon users and Nikon users are going to have a different word for it. Um, but essentially, what I'm talking about here is my autofocus mode for this was either um, zone, where I kind of tightened it down a little bit to cover. I'm going to go back to this image and show you what I'm talking about here. Since what I was after, and I was at it quite a distance, um, let me look at that setting. What distance was I at? I was at, um, by the way, my 100 to 400 in full frame equivalent is, um, when I'm at 400, I'm at 600 millimeters, uh, you know, uh, so it kind of makes it, what is it, a 150 to 600 full frame equivalent. Um, so it's a pretty good, got a pretty good reach. But what I'm trying to see here is how much I zoomed in and I can't, but it was pretty, it was pretty full. So I was in a ways focused on this area at 5.6 with area mode, you know, probably grabbed the nostril and the eye and the ear. These are on the same plane. So if you laid a stick between the ear and the eye and the nose, they're roughly on the same plane. So at 5.6, this whole area is gonna be pretty well in focus and the rest is gonna kind of melt away. Does that make sense? I hope. Um, some of this may sound really, really basic to you guys who already know how to do it. So, but I've just had so many questions from um, from beginners and stuff like that, that I just thought, what the heck, let's go over it. We don't talk about this stuff that often. I also really like for this, um, hair down here to be in focus. And sometimes I'm, I do it and sometimes I don't, you know, when you're photographing wild horses, I can tell you all the technique in the world. And then you get out there and you free ball it. <laughs> you just do the best you can. And it isn't always perfect. And that's kind of part of the fun. So that's the rundown on that horse. Be sure to fire any questions you have uh, um, along the way. Oops, sorry, banging around with the camera here um, because I'm covering the things that I was asked and I know about. Um, oh, the other thing I get asked is, you know, do I do handheld? And it's like, well, yeah, of course I do handheld. Um, tripods and doing these sort of things don't really work. So for this baby, same baby, I kind of <laughs> followed it around. I had a decision to make. Um, am I going to just focus on the eye? Am I going to worry if this grass in the front is out of focus? Because sometimes that bugs me and sometimes it doesn't. So you've got all these obstacles to, to wonder about. And um, I again, I put, I believe I did a spot focus on that. So that was just a single point. So I always focus on an eye because the eye is the window of the soul. And horses are very soulful. And so that, if I get nothing but a sharp eye, I feel successful. If other things aren't in focus that I wish were, if I have the eye, 
it still works because the story is there. The story's in the eye. Um, but here, you know, the baby wasn't moving that much. It was kind of looking at me, wondering what I was <laughs> looking at me, looking at it, <laughs> kind of wondering what I was up to. And uh, so I made a decision to, to use, um, again, F5.6, right? And, it's, and it ended up being, a, uh, how do you say that? A 30 second hundred, hundredth of a second, so that's plenty fast. I aim, like I say, I aim for a, at least a thousandth, thousandth of a second because I'm hand holding a big old fat telephoto, the animal's moving, and the faster I can make my shutter speed, the better as far as I'm concerned. So that's well within the range. Um, ISO 500, I'm not going to have that much grain on this particular camera. Um, Fuji films are kind of known for not a lot of grain. So, you know, it all worked out. And f5.6 at the distance I was shooting, show you this again, allowed the grass to be in focus. And that was largely a function of the fact that baby had her head more or less over top of the grass. So again, if you pull a stick up to her eye, it would be pretty straight, pretty much on the same plane, but just don't put the stick in her eye because that would be bad. Is this all, is this all interesting? I hope answering these questions. Now, what else? So here's the thing about, let's see, let me cover the basics. Aperture prior. Oh, I also, I forgot to tell you this. I shoot in aperture priority um, because aperture priority allows me to set the, de you know, establish the depth of field. Um, and for me, that's more important. Um, and then I just make sure I choose an ISO that allows the shutter speed to be at a thousandth of a second or is a thousandth of a second. So here's a good example of um, deciding about the eye and the story. This horse is focusing a little bit behind her and there was a little bit of a trick. So I used a, the spot focus on this because the forelock, oops, let me put this so that you can see this better. Her forelock is very close to her eye. And then, yes, I want her for luck. You know, if, if that can be in focus, that's great. That's ideal. At the distance I was showing. Now, if I get a whole lot closer, <clears throat> um, F5.6 will look shallower than when I'm a bit back and more zoomed in, to use common language. So when I'm zoomed in more, it creates a little more depth of field. Um, so that's that I knew would be the case here. I, knew, I figured 5.6 would probably grab this part of the forelock, which I wanted, but I focused right on her eyeball because I love seeing the light. She was sort of, well, the light was kind of coming from this back and to the side, and it was lighting up her eyeball. And I just find horses' eyeballs really interesting to look at, um, in, especially in context. And I also wanted part of her nostril down here to be in focus. So again, nostril, eye, forelock, all on the same plane. So focusing on her eyeball just also happened to get this whole area nicely in focus. So you got to be a little bit of a, I don't know what you call that when, you know, people who look at bodies and, and, you know, know what, what lines up with what well, I was, when I taught writing, we knew a lot about biomechanics and stuff like that. So I, I just think in terms of bodies and alignment sort of naturally, but if you don't do that naturally, you just have to learn a little bit about planes and alignment and what begets what, if that makes sense. <clears throat> so that was the deal there. Now, this, this image, I'm going to zoom this back a little bit. You'll see is dark. I also did this one in black and white um, because I have a whole bunch of, and I'll show you a couple of those, a lot of photos of wild horses just sort of out there, you know, in the field, and it's just all, it's all good lighting. They're, like I say, they're all good photos. They're all good sort of documentarian with some personal opinion uh, attached. But I got to thinking about these horses and I was like, how do I really want to photograph them? So like I talk to people a lot about when I teach, I talk about a, a lot about finding your artistic voice, um, photographing what you love and all this sort of stuff. And people think sometimes I'm just a little bit woo woo. But honestly, it's what allows you to create fine art. And by fine art, 
what I mean. The definition of fine art is, well, I shouldn't say the definition. I should say the, the common sensibility about fine art is that the artist has their opinion, their worldview, their take, their stamp. It's, it's their, their very unique personal ideas embedded in whether it's a painting or a photograph and it's very very specific it's usually got like a single point it's not it's not a photograph of a bunch of stuff it's usually really zeroing in on one idea and then blowing it up and making it your own making it your opinion your feeling your take so I had all these images just sort of figuring out how the horses moved and just what the whole scene was like for a year out here and because I haven't lived here that long and then I thought okay those are good they're fine but what's my take on this whole thing what is it about me and horses that I could represent in this way and it is that I've been around them I grew up with them they taught me how to live they taught me how to be human they taught me you know how to care about the world and and love and I mean you know all the stuff that makes life worth living horses taught me. So I thought, well, and, and I've spent a lot, I mean, you know, much of my life being very close to them and looking at their eyes and, you know, they breathe and their breath and the sound of them chewing and just all this really personal, intimate, uh, relationship with horses that I decided was what I wanted to start to show. And then the challenge became, now how the heck do I do that <laughs> with a wild horse? It's one thing with a domestic horse. It's another thing with a wild one. So, you know, I had just been going out on hikes and taking my 18 to 135, and that was fine. And I'll show you some of those. But I started lugging my 100 to 400 out on hikes because that was the only way I was going to get close enough so that you could, like, feel the breath. Because I wanted to share this very personal relationship that I have with horses through my images. So that's why I started to do them like this where I only took sections so I'm still experimenting you know I'm still finding my way with it but this is this is where I'm headed with it this is my voice with it this is my take because these expressions these like oh my gosh look at her eye oh my gosh look at how the sun you know bounces off her soul you know that kind of feeling that feeling even if it sounds goofy that's the feeling that's what I wanted to convey there's another thing that if you, like if on Instagram, you hashtag, you know, wild horses and you'll start to connect with many of the wild horse images. There are a lot of them that are out there. You'll also see a lot of heartbreaking things that happen on the BLM lands that they document. Um, Bureau of Land Management is BLM. Uh, that happen out uh, in like Utah and Colorado and other places. We don't have, these horses are not on BLM land, which is why Wild Horse Connection, um, that's the charity that I pinned in the comments. Um, So the Wild Horse Connection doesn't have to work with BLM. They work in a whole different way, which is better for everyone, in my opinion. But anyway, be that as it may, you'll see a lot of horse images on Instagram, and they're usually real light. And they're like white light, really bright images and I I tried that out here and I didn't really like it didn't have the same impact for me it didn't speak the same way that going dark does because the more I can do you know like darker backgrounds and and it's and it's more it's more mysterious right it's and it isn't just mysterious to me it's more intimate it's more has that that magic of the next moment what happens in the next moment. It's like a whole storytelling thing for me. And that's where I feel my voice starts to happen with the horses is with this darker background. So I've been asked about that because so many wild horses are shot really bright and they're beautiful. Don't get me wrong. I think they're gorgeous. So I'm not saying anything about them. I'm just saying that, um, for what I'm after, uh, here's an example of light, but which also had a stamp Anyway, so for what I'm after and the really personal ones, which again, I'll show you some more of, the darker background more works. But this is a lighter background and I liked it because of, I just shot the withers, like not even the face. And I can't even really, and it was snowing. So I don't know if you can see the snow. Um, 
I don't know if I can tell you why I love this so much. It's, it's just a slice of, there's another thing I teach, um, when I'm, when I am teaching and giving talks and stuff about, um, about photography and it comes under the heading of storytelling, being very specific. How do you do that when you look at a scene? Cause a lot of times I'm talking, uh, landscape when I'm t giving these presentations, but it, it's evident here where you decide what the DNA of the images and you really focus on that. And by DNA, what I mean is what is the, what is the scene? What is the subject boiled down to in its essence? What's the slice of what's the chunk down version of, and how can you frame that and capture that in such a way that it is minimal, but it says everything. So I love that challenge. It's a little esoteric. It's a little, artistic, but it's a really interesting thing to challenge yourself to do. And that was what this was. And I felt it was successful largely because it was snowing. Um, but because it was this slice that did not involve a face that still said it all, I just thought it was interesting and I liked it. I shot that at 5.6. So you see a theme here. Now here's something this was more towards the beginning of me learning the wild horses, which I did in the winter time. My um, shutter speed was 140th of a second, which isn't necessarily fast enough. So here's where decisions were made. Um, when I say it's not fast enough, it isn't really fast enough to necessarily, ca it won't catch, capture a moving horse. If you're moving a little and the horse is moving and the light's not super bright, your image is going to be not in focus. But what I wanted was that I could see the snow move. I wanted the snow to move, but I wanted the horse to be in focus. So let me see if I can show you how I did that. Whoops. So you can see where you can see the snow and there's some movement in the snow, the little streaks, but sorry about that noise. Um, it's in focus on the horse because he was still, so that was why I was able to do that. And that probably is another reason I like this one so much because I was able to get a little bit of movement and then um, have this all be in focus. So you're constantly playing your settings against what it is you're trying to create and the feeling. Um, ISO 640, which is, you know, well within, I don't have to worry about um, noise. The other nice thing out here, just as a sidebar, I don't have to worry too much about noise anyway because... Um, because I live, you know, this is high desert and there's just an awful lot of, you wouldn't even notice the noise with this kind of background. So that's handy. Now, then you're faced with things like this image right here. Um, of one of the babies and I had to decide very quickly, what do I want in focus? I want the background to blur. I wouldn't mind it at all if the tail's a bit in focus. Does it have to be perfect? I don't know, but I really, really want the face to be in focus. And so I did a, I believe it was an area focus. So it wasn't just spot on the eye, it included more. And sometimes I'll even take the risk of, you know, opening it up so it does the entire area. Um, and let's see what the setting was. And I lucked out because again, it was F5.6 and it was a four hundredths of a second and it was still in focus. If I wanted to get the shutter speed higher, I just raised the ISO on my camera. I could easily go to a thousand or 1600 without having to worry about um, noise being interfering. So that's a, that's a thing. <clears throat> Right. And I very often, not always, but I very often think of shooting in black and white, which is another reason why pull this back up. Uh, like I knew I wanted this to be in black and white and I wanted it to have that lighter background, partly because it would, the body, uh, the, the baby was dark. And so a dark background wasn't going to work. So I wanted it to be kind of glowy and dreamy in the background because babies are kind of glowy and dreamy. So I figured that would work. Um, and I loved the way she looked back at me and the fact that I was able to get her tail had I been a lot closer and photographed her eye, I would not have, and I still had the same frame, the tail probably wouldn't be in focus. It's not perfectly in focus, but it is, it's enough because her eye is totally in focus and her face. Is this helping? 
I hope so. hope this is answering some of the questions. Let's see. And then I want to just show you a couple. I think I've shown this in, in previous lives. This is one of the ones for the fine art side where the point of view is very, very strong. Um, I actually like photos with their eyes closed when they're looking alert, which you can tell in the ear. And, um, and this horse also had an interesting mane. So the whole thing just kind of worked and didn't really need to have open eye. In fact, it made it feel more like he was listening and then in this world unto himself, because that's how I experience each horse is with such focus that the rest of the world really falls away. Um, that's how it is for me. And setting was once again, 5.6 and 850, 800. <clears throat> so starting to see a theme there. So that was, um, so that has become like what I aim for and ditto with this shot because she looked, there's just such an expression here of her looking a little bit behind. And yet when you really look closely, you can actually see the land. You can see the, I don't know, I don't know if I can make this possible for you to see, but you can see the shadow and the land where she's standing in her eye, reflected in her eye, which is pretty cool. And then, um, I directed the light this and I did, you know, I did as much of it as I could in, uh, when I shot it, but <clears throat> because of her positioning and the fact that the light was coming from this direction all worked really well for this. But in post-processing, I, I brightened this and let, you know, let all this darken in and fade away. Um, and I allowed, I wanted the, the blurry mane because I wanted some depth. I wanted it to feel like it falls away. So these are decisions you make when you shoot. Um, I wanted her forelock. I wanted these little tendrils because it makes it really softens it, personalizes it. So fine art is very personal. Whereas, let me find a more general one. Um, did I put general ones in here? I don't know if I put too many general. There were just some that I just didn't think were very good. I could find them <clears throat> for you. Um, this was going to be a general one, and then this horse saw me and uh, was like, what? What are you? This is not the best focus in the world. I didn't know what I did wrong exactly, but it's not as sharp as I would like. I shot, and it should have been ISO 800, uh, 1100th of a second, F5.6. So pilot error sometimes happens. Here are some horses moving. Here's, an, here's one of the reasons why you try to shoot um, as fast of a shutter speed as you can if you want to you know, stop things. This was in Colorado and uh, the stallion on the right was moving his mares on the left you know, to where he wanted them to be. So there was like a whole thing going on here. So it was not so much a matter of um, zeroing in on one of them, but on what they were doing with each other, which is a story unto itself because, you know, the whole communication and everything. And I would have, let's see, if I can tell, you won't be able to see this, but I can. I believe what I did, yeah, so I shot F8 uh, and two thousandths of a second. I really made sure that I got that. It was, it was raining, so... Um, I went for ISO 500. It was bright enough, thank goodness, but it was raining and they were moving. And, you know, I was having to keep an eye on the horses that were getting close. <laughs> so I didn't really want to be in the path. So two thousandths of a second is even better. And I believe that what I should have done, I can't remember for sure, but what I should have done for what I wanted was either focus on this eye of this horse or on the face of this one. They're very close. Um, F8, uh, especially at that distance, allowed the depth of field to cover all of it. Because remember, I'm shooting an XT3 on this, so you multiply um, the F5.6 uh, by 1.5, which I think is around 11. Is that is that right? Am I right about that? Let me think. 
I don't know. I can't math it out right now. But anyway, it's 5.6 times 1.5 is my full frame equivalent depth of field. So it worked out. That was good. I was happy. Right. So now I had a question. So, so that covers kind of like by giving you, I'm going to um, flip this around here so I can just talk to you for a minute. So that covers kind of the basic, uh, you know, set of questions that I got throughout the, I did a live event for the charity. I did a live broadcast for the charity event last week and then a bunch of questions came in. So that's kind of, the, you know, lumping them all together, answering those to the best of my ability. So let me know if it doesn't. Then I got a specific one um, from one of my followers. I don't, like I say, I don't mention names unless I specifically have permission to do so because that can be an invasion of privacy and I don't like to do that. So they're photographing a wedding with a horse in a horse arena which is always torture because the light is always bad. Poor light, sure enough. Could I recommend a lens and a focal length uh, to start with? So that's a really good question because it really depends on, on, on your options here. Okay, so a lens, if, if it's all gonna be still and if you have control over that, you want to you want to get a lens that has the lowest aperture, you know, like a one point like f one point that goes down to like one point four, one point two, two point oh, no higher than two point oh, because that's gonna let you stop it down, get the most light, and then um, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, because it depends on how much you want to zoom in and how much space you have behind you. So is that a is that a ninety millimeter? Is that a fifty? Um, zoom lenses are going to tend to have, you know, they're not going to be as fast because they're going to only want to go down to like F. Well, in Fujifilm, we have a lens that's 50 to 140 that goes down to 2.8, F2.8. But for something like this, you really are going to probably want a lens that goes down lower. Like, like I say, 1.2, 1.4. Um, so it just depends on the lens that you have and the distances that you're working, but I, and it's may, you may need prime if you have, like, I have to use a zoom when I'm shooting wild horses because I can't control the environment that well, but in a, in a wedding situation, in a riding arena, you should be able to. So that's your starting point now. Yeah. And so she's saying that she's been trying to practice and, and notices she has to set her ISO really high, which is true without lighting you do. And then you do have grain, which some people like and some people don't. So, you know, that's kind of a personal thing. Um, you know, there's ways of processing that make the grain work for you, but it just depends on the vibe of the, of the wedding shoot. I'm not a wedding photographer, but, you know, the visual, uh, you usually have like a visual thematic, not just stylized, but in terms of post-processing that you'll want to maintain. So, and I don't know what that is, so I can't address that. Um, so you're shooting on shutter. I'm thinking about that because I normally shoot aperture, but if you have enough control, you can shoot shutter and you really do need to, to, to get it to go fast, which is why you want a really fast lens. Now, would a camera hit, hit show flash help? I don't use flashes, so I don't know all the, all the fancy lingo for flashes and stuff. Would a flash help? It might. The danger you've got, though, I can talk to you about horses, uh, which it might be fine. You might want to practice. And I don't know how good, you know, the people are with horses. So this, this really depends on who's handling the horses, how, you know, cool and relaxed and calm the horse is. But sometimes when you run a flash, the sudden flash will startle a horse. The horse jumps the rider falls off. I mean, I don't know. I'm not saying that would happen, but you don't want that to happen. So you're going to have a, and, the, and then the flash makes a sound on top of it. So horses are flight creatures. You know, they, they're not, um, they're not predators. They're not going to be the ones out in the field, you know, hunting you down to, to, you know, rip your flesh from your bones. They're going to be running <laughs> the other way because, you know, they've got wildcats, they got, you know, mountain lions that want to do that to them. <laughs> and they don't really ha have those defensive tools to deal with that. So they run, 
that's why they run and kick like kick run um so the answer to that is going to depend on those variables um Shutter speed is probably a smart idea. Again, I don't shoot in those environments. But the reason I think it's probably smart is if you really, really, really want to make sure you get that thousandth of a second. I can't even say it. Thousandth of a second. Um, again, I usually at least try aperture. I always shoot. I will say I shoot on uh, shutter speed when I'm flying. Like if I'm on a boat or on a plane and I'm photographing, I always shoot in shutter because I'm moving and the outside's moving, so I'm just gonna make sure that I get, because if I do aperture, it's always blurry, because, uh, so you're probably right, shutter is probably best, um, but if you wanna try a flash, do, it will help you be able to get your ISO down, um, but will the horse handle it? Will everybody handle it? Will it be a calm situation? You know, because wedding days, everybody's kind of like <gasps> excited and tense, but some horses are fine. Um, you, you want to make sure whatever kind of flash you use, it looks natural. It doesn't look like, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, again, I don't use flashes. Sorry. Um, so I don't know what a, um, yeah, I don't know what kind of flash you're talking about. If it's, it's on camera, usually it's not as good. You know, usually you'd want to set up, can't see, but you know, set up lights out so that you're, um, washing the scene rather than blasting the scene with one source. I know that much. So, you know, that the, answer, the real answer to that is going to be a combination of a wedding photographer and then a horse photographer. <laughs> Not that I'm a horse photographer, but um, I do photograph horses. And just understand that the behavior of the horse and how their nerves are, what, what they're used to, um, will determine whether you freak them out or not. So you'll have to figure that out and maybe practice ahead of time with the horse that's going to be used. Um, yeah, so just, you just needing starting points. My camera is a Nikon 7200, not entry level, but just above. Yeah, I mean, that should be what I just said would apply no matter what. Um, and that's that question. Does anybody else have any questions beyond what I covered here? Is that useful? Is that a good start? Is that just too basic? And if you have questions like that, um, that you want answered in this live situation. Fridays at uh, typically at 11 a.m. Pacific time is when I do these. And sometimes I have friends on. We talk photography and art and, you know, related. Sometimes I answer questions. Sometimes I show technique, um, you know, post-processing. I have a road trip coming up. We're going to see if I can do a live on Friday. Otherwise, uh, we may have to do something different, but um, I'm just going to roll through and see if we have any other questions. I just really wanted to respond to the ones I got. And, oops, there we go. So just as a reminder, as a final um, reminder about the charity event that I'm running, which is benefiting the Wild Horse Connection here in Reno, Nevada. Um, very unique organization, doesn't do it, you know, I've never met one that does quite what it does, which is facilitating this intersection of where the wild meets the, you know, the tame, the people, the, the, the urban growth. And, um, they don't just, you know, round them up with a helicopter and, and do whatever. They actually facilitate working together. So the wild horses can be wild horses and the people can be people and their worlds are not are not completely devastated by one another. They rehome them very often. There's, you know, they handle fencing, diversionary feeding if it's needed, which sometimes it is here because we're in a drought and there's very little feed to begin with. Um, but they they do everything to to help these horses retain their life and their quality of life. And where it's just not possible if they end up in the neighborhood too much and just decide that they want to move in, they'll rehome them, they'll move them out if they if they can, um, and they do try to keep the fencing up and so on and so forth. But it's an ongoing thing. And there are 3,000 horses in the Virginia range, so it's, it's a big job. So I'm doing what I can to contribute, and I hope you'll join me. I need your help to do that. Um, the link is at the, the top of the comments, and you can check out the charity page. You can donate anywhere from 10 to to $100 um, with a chance to win 
prints, different kinds of prints, different subject matter of prints, an hour with me if you want to do Q&A on a Zoom call. That's up for grabs. So um, we'll be doing, this runs through October 17th, and I will be doing more videos with Karina Vance, who is the head of the whole Wild Horse Connection organization. And you can check on my IGTV if you want to see the uh, the conversation that we had where we went over a lot of the stuff that they do. It's It's just really amazing. And I just really believe in helping where I can. You know, and this is something I could do. And I hope you'll join me. And I hope you'll join me next week for my next live. Hit me with any questions you got. DM me, email me, whatever. Check out the Wild Horse Connection. Uh, it's in my bio. You can always get back to it. And if there's nothing else, then, and there does not, oh, Rome. I see Rome, Italy. Hi, Rome. Rome, Italy in the house. I want to go back to Rome. Not where the Buffalo roam, but Rome, Italy. You know what I'm saying? So on that note, I'm going to let you guys go. It's been awesome, and I'll see you next time. Bye, guys.